Well, this morning we are rapidly nearing the end of our quarter study on the study of forgiveness that we've been doing, focusing on the heart of God. And uh, we uh, look, whoop, I was just going to go back, got two oil. This little clicker's got a mind of his own this morning. Let's see if he'll work here. Uh, we're looking at these various aspects of forgiveness. And for the last uh, three lessons, starting with this morning, we want to look at forgiveness seen. And uh, look at forgiveness seen. That is, what is the difference that forgiveness should make in our lives? How is the forgiveness of Christ seen in your life? Or is it seen at all? Uh, that's an important question for us uh, to ask. Even though uh, he was not interested in honoring God, uh, it's very curious uh, if you study his life or if you've read some of his works uh, to notice the observations that Mark Twain made throughout his life about Christianity. And um, many times we cite those and maybe we don't give that context. He was not a believer. Uh, he was not even a an adherent of any type of religious group, Christian or otherwise, that I can tell from my understanding of his life. And uh, yet he made some statements. Uh, certainly his writings uh, survive with great popularity today. But uh, he made some observations about uh, ideas that certainly intersect with biblical principles. And uh, one that I've always um, found to be very illustrative and uh, very thought-provoking is his quote on forgiveness. And um, Twain said, Forgiveness is the fragrance that the flower leaves on the heel of the one who crushed it. Just think about that for a moment. That's a very poetic uh, way of uh, expressing it, and you would expect that from a writer of uh, his caliber or quality of forgiveness. It's the fragrance the flower leaves on the heel of the one who crushed it. Uh, you know, no matter how you uh, treat me, so to speak, uh, I'm still going to forgive you and leave you with that impression, with that uh, sort of memory to take with you, if you will. And uh, the Bible backs up that idea of forgiveness. It tells us that forgiveness is a transformation that should take uh, place in our lives. As we seize the forgiveness of God shown through Christ, uh, forgiveness ought to just naturally flow out of us as it has been given to us through uh, Jesus. Matthew 18, if you'll turn your Bible there, we want to spend a good majority of our time this morning <clears throat> in this chapter. And um, as soon as you start talking about uh, forgiveness, uh, this question sometimes comes to the forefront. And um, really it may betray a lack of understanding of forgiveness altogether if this is the first question we ask. Uh, nevertheless, this is a question that was even asked in Scripture and the Lord is going to uh, address it. And um, it's one that we've all asked and wondered about even if not ask out loud, we have internally thought to ourselves, well, you know, I hear you say forgiveness, and I understand my responsibility to do that, and I know I should, but you know, there's always a, a but you know, you know, there's just something else. When uh, I felt, or when you felt the pain of another's boot, if you will, the last thing you want to do is forgive, but then maybe you're convinced to forgive, and you grant that forgiveness, but then it happens again. Or then the need for forgiveness arises once more. And you say, but that previous hurt, how can I put that aside? Or that last time that I forgave, wasn't that enough? And uh, maybe another, you know, series of emotions and questions come to mind. Uh, maybe some of them involve our pride in thinking that we are better than the person who has offended us or sinned against us and thus have the right to reserve or to restrict uh, forgiveness. Uh, but maybe the question that is paramount and uh, receives the priority in all of our minds as we think about forgiveness is this one. Well, you know, just how often or rather how much should I forgive? How much is enough when it comes to forgiveness? Um, you have had the experience again of having to answer that with someone who has sinned against you more than once. Um, I, I know that. And I'll, I'll say that for all of us, and with no attempt to be humorous, uh, we know that's true in any relationship. But when we talk about marriage, for instance, uh, that's certainly uh, true. Uh, when we talk about uh, even uh, parenting or being a child, you know, any relationship that has any depth of, uh, you know, deepness to it, if you will, when there's any uh, degree of closeness between two individuals in that relationship, they want to cultivate and uh, even further. 
um, you know, grow, there's going to be conflict. It's just the nature of two imperfect people trying to get along, not always seeing things the right way, not always treating each other the right way. And so certainly a forgiveness uh, comes into play in all of those uh, sorts of scenarios and in those relationships. In Matthew 18, <clears throat> Verse 21, we'll just pick out these two verses to begin with, and then we'll kind of go back and forth through the chapter. They're found about smack dab, if you will, in the middle of the chapter. So uh, maybe it's kind of the hinge point for both what precedes it and that which follows it. Uh, Peter came to him, that is to Jesus, verse 21, and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Lord, just how often shall my brother? Now, of course, in the Jewish uh, vernacular, brother is uh, the term just used for any fellow man. It's not restricted here in the spiritual sense that Paul will later use it when he calls us brothers and sisters in Christ, having that spiritual bond because of the blood of Jesus. I think it's more generic than that. Although certainly forgiveness must be extended to our Christian family, maybe even more generously than those who are non-Christians. That's maybe a debate for a little bit later on in the lesson. But here, uh, generically, uh, Peter's just saying, Lord, when someone sins against me, how many times shall I forgive him? Up to seven times. No, not seven, but 70 times seven. Now, why did Peter just pull out that number seven? If you study Scripture... Uh, sometimes the numerology of it, seven represents a complete number. And uh, for instance, you turn to the book of Revelation, you have seven churches of Asia. That doesn't mean there were just seven churches in that uh, time period in existence. There were probably many more than that, but these seven were selected maybe just as representative of the others and the lessons that are taught to each one. There's uh, other uses, uh, usages of seven in that book symbolically Usually, the idea is representing completion, if you will, or uh, totality. Uh, there's uh, other reasons we think why perhaps Peter um, picked that number. I don't think he picked it, if you will, out of thin air. Uh, there is the thought that in that day, those who were responsible for teaching the law as uh, rabbis would say that three times was the limit each day. In other words, you know, if someone sins against you uh, in the morning at breakfast, you could forgive them. And if they sin against you around lunchtime, you could forgive them. And maybe, you know, the mid-afternoon break time, uh, they did it again. You could do that the third time. But uh, then there had to be almost an, a warning issue, a caveat to say, hey, uh, you've reached your limit, buddy. That's three times for today. Uh, you're not going to get any more forgiveness until tomorrow from me. And so maybe Peter says, well, Lord... That, that seems a little limited. Uh, so, you know, if I really want to be, uh, you know, so very generous with my forgiveness, I'm going to say that seven times. After all, that's twice as much and throw in one. So seven times. Is that what he meant? Uh, that's an idea that's suggested. Uh, I don't know. Anytime it's necessary, that's what we're going to see. So uh, this perfection or completion in the Hebrew mindset, doubling what the rabbi said plus one, uh, Peter was not asking for less than what people believed in that way, but maybe many times uh, more. Well, Jesus said, no, Peter, it's not seven times. Peter, you need to increase your math, and uh, you need to understand that 70 times seven is the number uh, I expect. Now, again, if you need a little help with that, today we have our phones with us that have a calculator built in, or you can take off your uh, shoes and start counting on your toes, you know, but most of us, uh, we can do the math and say, okay, Jesus, 490 times, 490 times, okay, I've got it. That requires a little bit of a bigger ledger sheet to carry around with me, but you know, I can start making my tally marks. And uh, maybe for some of us, if we're especially gifted at messing up and, uh, you know, stumbling along life's pathway against others, uh, you know, they might have by lunchtime, we might already have that halfway filled up. We might already be at 250 uh, needed times of forgiveness. Was that what Jesus meant 490 times in one day or one period? Is this for a month or a year? Is this running from one day of atonement to the next day of atonement that we talked about a few weeks ago? Is that what he means? Well, of course not. 
He's talking about something else. And to prove it, <clears throat> Jesus tells uh, this parable, uh, this earthly story with a heavenly meaning, as we often call it. Now, uh, I don't have it on screen here, but uh, if you'll notice back of this chapter, in chapter 18, uh, Jesus starts it out by asking the question, who then is the, or rather the disciples ask the question, let me give credit where credit is due, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, you know, that's a question that's age old. And we, you know, debate it in almost every facet of life. Those of us that like to watch sports, uh, I don't know what percentage of content that makes up most of your sports shows, uh, talk shows on the radio or programs uh, on TV, but usually that's a large chunk of the discussion. You know, some player has a great game, scores so many points, and they automatically want to put it in context to say, you know, he had the greatest night ever, or this is the best game that's ever been played by a person at that position, or something to that effect. Uh, it's something that's age old. If you don't like sports, you can think about whatever uh, you enjoy. If you like to watch movies, you'd say this is the greatest actor or actress or the greatest author or again, whatever. We want to know who's on top. And that's the way that the disciples perhaps are thinking when they ask Jesus, who's on top, Lord? Who's the greatest? Jesus calls a little child. And uh, something about that even impresses me, that little children were not afraid to be in the midst of Jesus. Uh, but this little child is brought before them. I can just see Jesus kind of embracing him, maybe sitting the child on his lap or giving him a, a side hug, as it were. And Jesus said, here he is. And I say he, it doesn't even tell us if it's a male or a female, a little boy or a little girl. But if you want to be great, be like this. Unless you're converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what's he mean by that? Well, if you cause one of these little ones that believe in me to stumble, just go ahead and tie a millstone around your neck and jump in the deepest part of the lake. What, what are you talking about, Jesus? He goes on uh, in verse 11. Uh, what do you think about a man? Uh, I've come to seek and save the lost. And if you had a hundred sheep, would you leave the 99 in the barn to go find the one that was lost? Or would you say, hey, one's... One's an acceptable amount of loss, or would you go even trying to find the one? And then he talks about, well, when your brother sins against you, and that's what prompted the first question we started with from Peter, how do you handle that? And Jesus gives a process by which conflict resolution uh, must be uh, handle that's sadly often ignored today. But all of that then kind of is the background that we reach um, when we come to verse 21. Well, just Lord, how often should I forgive? I've told you about the children. I've told you about my mission, saving sheep, even if it's only one. I've told you how to handle your conflict with your brother or sister. Uh, now, 490 times, Lord, is that really what you mean? Is that really the amount and no further? Well, Jesus answers, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king. He wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Maybe it was April 15th in the kingdom. I don't know. Uh, you know, that day's coming up. Most of us dislike it. When he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, when we hear the word talents, we think of ability sometimes, especially in Matthew 25. One man five, one man two, one man one. But talent is a weight of measurement of whatever you're measuring. It could be gold. It could be silver. Uh, the assumption here is 10,000 talents, 10,000 measurements of weight of gold coinage or gold currency of whatever type. 10,000 talents. Now one talent, one talent is 6,000 denarii. That's the way the measurement would have worked out. Now a denarii or a denarius is the singular, was the typical day's wage. So just keep that in mind. Uh, this man owed 10,000 talents. Man, what had he been doing? You know, he was borrowing. Um, you know, no one stopped him, the loan officer didn't say, you know, you might want to reconsider your balance sheet here. Uh, your profit loss statement doesn't suggest that you can float a loan of this much money or of this much debt, but none of that happened apparently. He was not able to pay. That's the understatement, verse 25. Of course he couldn't. So his master, uh, there whether that master is the king, I've always kind of wondered about that. It seems that it is because later on, uh, the king is going to intervene when the tables turn, but it's interesting. He's called the king now. He's called the master. Commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. 
In that day, and even up until actually fairly recent times, debtor's prison uh, was a way in which uh, debts were paid. If you want to solve you know, our national deficit, um, you know, maybe that would be a place to start. Of course, you'd have to put all the politicians in jail first, and that may not be a bad idea either. But anyways, uh, here, let's go on. Servant falls down. Master, have patience with me. Just listen, and we can hear the empathy, uh, the passion in his voice, the sincerity in his voice. I'm not doubting whatsoever. Be patient with me, and I will pay you all. Okay, just keep that in mind. That's his request. And we can understand if we were in his position, we would probably make the same petition. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now, there are several things going on. Moved with compassion, that's admirable. A man that uh, can, you know, have some ability to stand over his fellow man and yet see his fellow man in the lower position as his, if not his equal, at least as one to be pitied and then to extend that pity, uh, we commend such an individual for his condescension, if you will, not condescension in a negative way, but a condescension uh, in a positive light. He felt for him. He understood his plight. He maybe saw his wife and children and thought, what if my wife and children were put in the same position as these uh, that I'm seeing? So he's condescended in compassion and mercy. He released him. So you're not going to have to go to jail. That's good enough. And had I been there, I, I probably would have said, thank you. And I'm going right back to work and I'll start sending in additional payments on principle uh, tomorrow. But he did something additionally. He forgave him the debt. And that's the remarkable part forgave him the debt. But that servant, verse 28, it seems, wasting no time whatsoever, went out and found one of his fellow servants. Now think about this, and you can agree or disagree, and I welcome your feedback on it. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now what's he thinking? I admit I've often read this and said he's thinking, well, I need to get that money from my fellow servant in order to pay back my master that I'm indebted to. But does that work? That doesn't fly, does it? Because what just happened? He was forgiven. He doesn't owe that man anymore. But now, one that owes him. You see, it's not that he's saying, well, I need that hundred denarii out of you because I've got to apply that to the balance that I owe with the guy that, you know, I'm indebted to. But he doesn't owe that guy anymore. He's not indebted to anyone anymore. So this is just a matter of his own selfishness. 100 denarii, and he laid hands on him, took him by the throat. You might have got an angry phone call from a debt collector, but I, I don't know if anyone's ever uh, took you by the throat. I'd say that's against bank regulations, John, isn't it? I, I suppose that's probably a, a, not the right way to settle a, a, a debt, at least uh, in an official capacity. Now, if you had some other under-the-table debts or shady business dealings, that might be even common practice today. But pay me what you owe. What you owe me. Who did he owe? He didn't owe anyone. But he now knows that someone else owes him. His servant fell down at his feet. These little details Jesus adds in that are so, I think, poignant. Notice it doesn't uh, uh, tell us, uh, again, anything about how the debts were incurred. None of that uh, that might sometimes uh, be of interest to us. That's not the focus of Jesus. His fellow servant fell down at his feet. What did this man do previously? Verse 26, he had fallen down before his master's feet. And so the same actions that this servant is taking toward him is the same actions he had taken toward his master just, it seems, moments earlier, or at least some short while before, begged him. Same idea. Begged him, saying, have patience with me. Same thing he had said in verse 26. And I will pay you all. Same thing he had said in verse 26. But he would not, but went and threw him in prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow servant saw what had been done, apparently there were some present in both in, uh, exchanges or interactions, they were very grieved. Uh, really, the idea, as I understand it, the original language communicates the idea uh, somewhat of, you know, they just can't believe this. You know, you've seen things happen, you know, between people. And you just made the comment, whether you said it out loud or whether you just said it in your own mind. All of us have sometimes been witness to, 
you know, how people treat each other. And we just stand back and we say, I can't believe that. Did you see that? Can you imagine what he just did? That seems to be the impression Jesus is attempting to communicate and convey. His fellow servants were very grieved. And here the egregious, you know, behavior, there had to be some remediation of it. It had to be addressed. So they came and told their master, the same master of this man as well, all that had been done. His master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant. Very strong term, but a fitting adjective and description of this man. I forgave you. See, he wasn't saying, well, you tried to get that out of the other guy so you could pay me. Hey, that's a good job. I appreciate, uh, you know, you No, it's not what he says. There's no debt anymore. I forgave you all that debt. All that debt. Because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? Shouldn't you treat people with the same kindness and compassion and mercy and grace? Shouldn't you forgive because you are forgiven? That's the question of the hour. His master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Now, verse 35 is the point of the entirety of the story and every detail and description therein. So my heavenly Father also will do to each of you. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Just to make the story even more alive, if you will, one talent is 6,000 denarii. The denarius is the daily wage. Okay, we established that a moment ago. So this man was indebted to his master to work for 60 million days. That's what would have been required when he says, uh, back in verse 26, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And it will only take me 60 million days of work to pay you all that I owe. Or, roughly, 191,693 years. This doesn't seem to be a true story. Uh, unless this servant represents the U.S. government. You know, no, <laughs> no that... That's about the only entity I've known throughout history that can run up that amount of debt in this amount of time. But anyway, like I said, another time and place story. For uh, Either way, I've got two. Yeah, either one. Who wants to go first? Go ahead. Yes. Yep. It's a very good point. Uh, I've listened since, I guess, since uh, even before 2000, uh, when Dave Ramsey was just first starting out in Nashville. Some of you know Dave Ramsey's name, and you know people will call in and they'll say, you know, I'm half a million dollars in debt. Well, what do you make a year? Well, I make $15,000 a year. You know, and you're like, how'd you get into half a million dollars debt, you know, making 15? That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but some of them's not big. And they would say, you need a bigger shovel, you know, to dig yourself out of debt. And sometimes you can't find a bigger shovel. In the sense of, is he escaping his obligation altogether? Perhaps. And um, if you didn't uh, hear Doug's question, you know, what uh, part does the man's sincerity and his plea for forgiveness, does that have any part in it? And uh, perhaps that is uh, actually probably next week that'll be covered more than this week because I'm going to try and I know it's, a humongous can of worms over here that, you know, sometimes we're scared to open. Uh, how, how does forgiveness play into my relationship with a person when they seem to be unwilling to seek it or desire it? That's kind of, I guess, the question you're getting to. We, we'll address that in uh, the next couple of lessons. And uh, so I won't touch on all of that this morning. Uh, but here, I, I don't know that Jesus is necessarily looking at it so much from that perspective. In this particular parable, there are some that maybe address that more than this one. Right. And there has to be some movement made uh, in order to uh, receive that forgiveness. And that's the same maybe flaw that a lot of people have today, even as it relates to God. They say, well, if God loves me, he'll forgive me. Okay, yes, that's true. 
but they're unwilling to do what God has said to do in order to receive or to gain that forgiveness. We don't gain in the sense of earn it or merit it. We've established that before already in these lessons. But just to say, well, God loves me, so God will forgive me. But I'm unwilling to take any action that God has told me to take in order to receive that forgiveness. Well, I don't really believe Him, it seems, uh, in that sense. But uh, here we have a man, and uh, to both points, uh, Brandon and Doug, yeah, just give me some more time and I'll, I'll dig out eventually. I'll make, it, I'll make a way somehow. I mean, uh, is that what he's uh, talking about? Well, uh, Jesus is uh, here providing us uh, this very vivid account of just the folly, if you will, of trying to keep our forgiveness, if you will, tabulated. And, you know, saying, well, you know, I've been given this much, so I must dispense this much. Uh, I've only received this much, so I'm only expected to give this much in return. Uh, Jesus uh, maybe the conclusion is, as we said, verse 35, here's what we do. We understand our Heavenly Father uh, is the one who is so gracious and so forgiving and who understands, or at least we should, our indebtedness to Him far exceeds anything that we could ever pay back in any way or any wise, any amount of time, and yet He forgives us, so um, He'll do to you. That is, if you're not willing to extend that same forgiveness to others, from your heart and forgive your brother his trespass, well, don't expect the master to forgive you either. And so um, it's just one of those um, just so very uh, powerful parables uh, that Jesus uh, tells. And actually, probably it makes what he had told Peter earlier look a lot more attractive. 70 times 7 doesn't seem that bad when you're talking about a debt of 191 mil, or 191,000 years excess. So, um, what does this mean in real life? Uh, Self-application, uh, not myself, uh, although it could probably certainly be said, but uh, I read about this account and uh, this has actually been duplicated by counselors at different times through the years, but a marriage couple were having some difficulties and uh, they were fussing a little bit more than usual and so they finally decided to go and see a professional, counselor, therapist, whatever the case may be, and uh, they both were just squawking back and forth and, you know, the counselor couldn't make any headway. And so he gave them an exercise. You often get homework in a counseling setting. And so he said, for one month, I, I want both of you to keep a fault box, fault box or a fault jar. And just whenever, uh, you know, the other, whenever your spouse does something you don't like, you just write it down and you drop it uh, in your jar and then bring it back at the end of the month and we'll talk about them. So uh, he thought they would do that. So uh, he began writing them down. And this is what he dropped in for her. She watches TV too loud. She doesn't iron my shirt. She left the lid off the jelly jar. She misplaces her key. She spends too much money and she never compliments me. And uh, that was just a representative sampling. And uh, so um, all of those were read. And uh, the wife was just kind of sitting there with her head kind of hung low and she was just kind of nodding along. Uh, in a sad sort of way, and uh, she handed over her fault jar, and the therapist began to read it. Every one of them, she wrote, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And uh, it melted his heart, because he understood there were plenty of times when he too needed forgiveness, when he too had done things that she could have written uh, in her little fault jar, if you will, but she understood uh, forgiveness is a far better gift to give uh, than the accounting of faults. And no matter what people do to us, we can really spend time, and that's really, I think, uh, the question for this morning is, what do I spend my time focusing on? The hurt that is done to me, or uh, the willingness that I have even to take those hurts and put them aside in my attempt to love the person and try to help them and to move past uh, those things. Uh, if God kept a record, and I meant to write this down, and it escapes my memory even right now. Some of you might remember it by uh, your own personal previous study. Uh, you remember, and I, I want to say it's in Psalms. One of the Old Testament writers says, Oh, Lord, if you, know, if, if you were to take account, or if you were to keep a record, oh, Lord, who should stand, or who could stand? I forget exactly how that's phrased, uh, but that's the idea. If God kept a record of wrongs, who could stand? The idea is, uh, if you're going to deal with God on that basis, if God is going to say, okay, here's the record of all of your wrongs, and let's stop, uh, start at the top of the list, and you have to work through them one at a time. 
you have to mark them off the list one at a time. And if you don't get to the end of the list before you get to the end of your life, or if you keep adding to it, uh, then you're going to be, you know, out of luck, so to speak. Well, who could stand? None of us could. Ephesians chapter 4, it won't be on screen, but you know this verse probably without turning there. Paul, writing to the church and Christians at Ephesus, has already told them uh, what God has done for us through Jesus in chapter 2 having saved us by His grace because He's rich in mercy. Yes, faith is required in the proper response of faith. We're not uh, eliminating that whatsoever, but it's still God's grace that uh, provides that means whereby we enjoy the riches of God's mercy. Uh, verse 32, by way of summary then, chapter 4 has told us how we ought to live in unity and walking in a certain way, that is living uh, in imitation of our Savior. And here this verse kind of putting a bow on it, Paul says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as. That's a powerful uh, phrase, um, both in the original language as well as in English. It communicates the same idea in both. In this way, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's the response, uh, if you will, of forgiveness. A direct link between how I treat others uh, is my understanding and how God has treated me. I maybe didn't say that right. How I treat others is representative of my understanding of how God treats me. And there are people that debate that and doubt that and try to deny that's true. But um, that seems to be exactly what Paul uh, is saying here. If you're kind to one another, if you're forgiving, if you're merciful, if you're gracious in your dealings with other people, uh, you're a person that understands how God has dealt with you in Christ. And if you don't understand that, then you're not going to treat other people in that way. There's really no other option. Uh, this isn't inspired, of course, but I, I thought this statement was uh, well worded. As we practice the work of forgiveness, we discover more and more that forgiveness and healing are one. And... Um, what we mean by that, of course, is uh, we often want people to overlook our faults. Or at least I do. You know, maybe I'm an oddball, but I don't think so. You know, we all want people to overlook our thoughts, but we're unwilling to overlook theirs. Uh, we want people to be merciful to us, but sometimes we're unwilling to be merciful to them. Um, we are uh, people that want just a one-sided forgiveness, if you will. That is, the one-sided forgiveness is, I want it for me, but I don't want to give or to extend that same mercy that I have received. Uh, again, you don't have to turn there because you remember well what he says, but in Matthew chapter 5, uh, when Jesus uh, tells us about living in the kingdom, uh, he tells us, uh, beginning in verse uh, 44, actually verse 43, You've heard that it was said, love your enemy and hate, or love your enemy, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. You've heard that said. Yeah, that's the, that's the statement we can latch on to. But Jesus didn't let it in there. He didn't stop, but he said, but I say to you, which is that formulaic phrase that he uses all throughout chapter 5 to say, this is what the law demanded, and you thought that was enough, or you thought that was sufficient. I'm going to increase your understanding of it or deepen your responsibility toward it. If you're going to be in my kingdom, be one of my followers, there's more expected of you. Love your enemies. Now, when we hear that, I'll admit that uh, for most of my life and growing up kind of in the context uh, that I did, you know, love your enemies means, uh, you know, the terrorist that blows up innocent civilian life, either on September 11th or whatever. If I ever encounter one of those guys at the airport or somewhere else, I have to be nice to him. That's kind of what, you know, a default kind of understanding, very surface level understanding. That's what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies. Well, I'm sure Jesus would uh, certainly have us to be nice to, you know, if we were to meet uh, a person who is an adherent of the Islamic faith in the airport, yeah, be nice to them. It includes that, but it includes so much more than that. Here, enemies doesn't just mean the man that is holding the other end of the gun that he's pointing at you. I think this is just, if you will, this is a day-by-day, -day, everyday situation when I meet people that, uh, whether they understand it or not, whether they're even deserving of the label enemies or not, uh, just the people that I have an opportunity either to show love and compassion and mercy and grace to or otherwise. Because Jesus said, bless those who curse you, whether you hear them do it or not. 
Do good to those who hate you, no matter if they were good to you to start with. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We can talk about the big moments of how this might be manifest in some outrageous situation, but I think Jesus is talking about every day. Your co-workers, your family members might even be included by that. And you say, well, my family isn't my enemy. But sometimes, again, how we treat each other, we have an opportunity to respond either as Jesus would or as we kind of default to with the same spite and same hatred or the same unwillingness to be kind, the same uh, reluctancy to forgive. But Jesus said, you're different if you're my follower. You'll be sons of your Father in heaven, children of your Father in heaven, because here's how God operates. Sends a son on the uh, evil and the good, rain on the just and the unjust. If you only love those that love you, what reward do you have? The word there, love, doesn't just mean smoochy, kissy, huggy. Uh, he's talking about, you know, how we treat each other. If we only treat people nice that treat us nice, well, there's nothing to that. That requires nothing uh, at all. Thomas Adams, again, not an inspired writer, but uh, I think he well articulated this thought. He that demands mercy and shows none ruins the bridge over which he himself is to pass. And that's exactly what Jesus said in the next chapter, in Matthew chapter 6. Because in verse 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, it's a big one, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And that ought to get all of our collective attention uh, zeroed in on the frightening possibility that Jesus said is very, um, very much a potential for some people. If I'm unwilling to forgive others, then I can be assured that God is not going um, to forgive me. Now, we end, and maybe this is where you thought we would start with, but this is where we end, and I, I know this verse can be misused. And um, it, it kind of echoes back to what we said earlier, but Jesus, even as they nailed him, to that old rugged cross and put him in place there, hung between heaven and earth. Uh, one of the amazing last statements of his life is this one. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It's not a blanket extension of salvation irrespective of any response of people from that point onward or even that point backward. Uh, Jesus isn't saying, you know, what I'm doing, they don't have to do anything as by way of response. That would fly in the face of all of the instruction found in the remainder of the New Testament, beginning in Acts 2 onward. So certainly there is some response that we must make, but yet it displays to us, perhaps in a way more powerfully than any other uh, event of his life, the attitude, the posture that Jesus took toward us. He was willing to forgive. And I think that's exactly what he desires of us, the same. Uh, we need to forgive, and um, we can think about all of the times that uh, we can show the forgiveness of God uh, better than what we have. And uh, hopefully with His help, we can do that going forward. Next week, we'll continue this discussion on forgiveness, the difference it should make in our lives, hopefully answer some of the questions that maybe even were uh, discussed this morning. Any other questions or comments before we close today? Thank you for your good attention uh, this morning and your study together with us.